very strange start to my appointment here at Walnut United Methodist Church. Um, but you all know that it is going around very rapidly right now. Um, there have been many churches who have canceled in-person worship for a few weeks, but I figured it was okay first because I'm just so new here with you all that it felt not appropriate to do that. And also the, the numbers have been smaller and probably for the better during this surge time. But I want to reiterate to just, you know, make sure your, uh, your faces are covered, to use hand sanitizer, to refrain from, um, you know, holding each other's hands or shaking hands if you do, that's okay. Just remember to wash afterwards. And we're gonna get through this time as tough and as mysterious as it is. Um, I wanna thank Carol again last week for just coming to the pulpit and preaching my sermon and John Ripmeyer for the Facebook images. And of course, everybody else, like the welcome team who was always, always at the table and the, 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 the teachers who take care of Sunday school. So thank you all for just letting church continue to go on without me. And that's, that's wonderful. Um, I will be hosting Coffee Hour again this week. And that's, oh, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, and Stacy Manfredi said, Starbucks is not the place to be. You need to go to Donut Tree. Like that's the place where people go in Walnut. Okay, so this week I'm gonna be at the Donut Tree on Wednesday from nine to 11 and I'll send it out in a newsletter as well. A reminder that uh, the Super Bowl is happening here. Do you wanna say anything about that, Linda or anybody else? Okay, great. Can people bring it during the, they should probably bring it on Sundays, right? Okay, so bring canned soup on Sundays. It was stored in the office and they're all going to go uh, for the Inland Valley Hope Partners. Um, I want also to bring attention to the order of worship in the back of the pews. I know this has been mentioned before. These are not bulletins, they're just the order of worship, the template to follow along. Since I changed the order ever so slightly, you can touch them, you don't have to touch them. The service is still being streamed here um, on the PowerPoint as well. Are there any other announcements for the good of the order? All right, well today we talk about Jesus' first miracle, the wedding in Cana. And now our liturgist will lead us in the call to worship. Please rise in body and or spirit for the call to worship this morning. Sing praises to God, O you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. You hear us, O God and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our, our souls cannot be silent. Let us worship our God. Let us pray the opening prayer together. Holy, Holy God, God, through signs of grace, grace, you reveal your glory to all the world. Open our eyes to the hidden and surprising wonders you perform, that we may believe with our minds and trust in our hearts, that you alone are Lord of all creation. Through Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please remain standing, remain standing as you're able for our opening hymn, Immortal invisible God only wise.
and before I ask the children to come forward, I'm, I'm wondering, is this is the room warm for you right now? Yeah, yeah okay. Can somebody turn off the heat? It has been a warmer week uh, this week. And then I'd like for the children to come forward for the children's time. Hello, everybody find your little ex. Unless you're with a grown up and you can sit with your grown up, but you can find your little ex. Okay, you can sit or stand. Actually, why don't you stand with me? So, I'm going to tell you guys about Jesus' first miracle. <clears throat> Do you know what a miracle is? A miracle is when somebody does something that you don't expect. That you don't expect. Kind of like magic. But it's even better than that. And so Jesus' first miracle that surprises everybody is at a wedding. Have you guys ever been to a wedding before? It's kind of like a big party, you know, where people decide to, to live together. And they have run out of wine. And um, do you guys know what wine is? Yeah? No? What's, what's your name? Colin. Colin. I would love to hear what you think wine is. It's a drink. It's a drink. You are correct. It's a special, uh, maybe your mom loves wine. I love wine too. Um, it's a special drink that grown-ups drink at parties. That's right. Or sometimes by themselves when they need a little party. Um, and they run out of uh, this wine that they drink at parties, which is so important for parties. It's basically like juice at a kid's birthday party. There's no more juice. That's a big deal. And do you know what Jesus does? He asks for the water, and then he turns it into wine, right? And then he gives it to all the people at the party to drink. And so they have more wine to drink. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to think of, for you, what is your most fun place to be? Is it a birthday party? Is it Disneyland? What's your most fun place to be in life right now? Yeah, go ahead. Alana. Disneyland. That's awesome. What, what about you, Colin? What do you love to be? Any time with your family. These are just too good, you guys. These are too good. Did you give him that answer? My son would never give that answer. Yes. Okay, so I want you to know this. That wherever you are having fun, that Jesus is with you. That Jesus is not just at church with you. That Jesus is not just praying with you. He's not just at Bible study with you. He's there too in Sunday school. But he's also at Disneyland with you. He's also with you with your family. He's also with you at birthday parties. That Jesus loves to have fun with us. Isn't that great? All right, let's pray together. You guys can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God we thank you for always coming to the most fun places of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining me up here. And as the children go off to Sunday school, we um, are going to sing our next hymn.
from the Gospel of John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, <coughs> excuse me, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Then his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, although the servants who had drawn knew, the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Can Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a wedding in Cana, and as is customary in the ancient Near East, Jesus and his family are there, along with the entire village because weddings were not just private family affairs back in those days. They were public community events where the entire village was invited. And an integral part of such successful events, as you would imagine, was making sure that there was an abundance of food and beverages for all the guests. Food and beverages were the glue that brought the people together and to keep the party going. And of course, that's still the case today. And let's be clear that ancient Near East weddings weren't like modern day black tie cocktail hours of today, where people are just holding a glass of champagne with a little strip of asparagus tied to a little piece of bacon tied together by a toothpick. No, 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 no. Weddings back then, and even in some places in the world today, these are weak long affairs. The meat that they were eating came from animals fattened for months. The wine had been especially prepared and aged for years. The fruit and the vegetables served would have been picked at harvest and timed just so that all the wedding guests could eat the produce at their perfect brightness. And where Jesus and his family are now in the story, it is probably the pinnacle of the wedding, the feast where all have gathered to eat and drink for hours into the night. But here at the start of the story, we hear that they've run out of wine. Now for those of us who have been to big family wedding celebrations, we know that running out of wine, or any good beverage for that matter, is a big deal. It's like calling an end to the party itself. There's no wine. Sorry folks, you gotta go home. Now we don't know why the bride and groom didn't prepare enough wine. I'm sure that they've gone to many weddings in their lives. I'm sure they, or at least their parents, had a reasonable estimate of how much to prepare for their guests. Did they not have enough money? Were some guests drinking too much than, like, than, than others? We're not sure. We're not sure why they run out of wine, but what we do know based on the text and what we know about weddings back then is that this is a big deal. There's no more wine. What's surprising though is what happens next. And because they didn't have grocery stores like us today where they could just make a quick run and get some more in stock, the only way that they could get more wine is if they wait another two years for another batch to age and ferment 
the bride and groom would have had no choice but to tell their guests that they're out of wine. But Jesus' mother calls Jesus to him and tells him, they run out of wine. And Jesus responds, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I know that to modern day ears, this might sound like a very rude response to a mother. Woman, what concern is that to you and me? But in actually back then, uh, the term mother was a common way for men to address women in public. And what he tells her then, my hour has not yet come, is that this is neither the place nor the time to reveal that he is the Messiah. They're at a wedding, for goodness sakes. They, along with the rest of the people, are supposed to be celebrating the couple, not pointing to himself as the object of glory. But Jesus gives in and decides to proceed in a subtle way so that attention isn't drawn to his powers, but back to the party. And when the chief steward, is, who is basically a leader of the community, tastes the wine that Jesus has converted, he gives credit to the groom. The chief steward said, everyone serves a good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. The party keeps going, the people keep celebrating, and the bride and groom are none the wiser as they are preoccupied with guests and presents and dancing and conversations. So here's a photo of my own wedding 11 years ago. Um, my parents have a large property in Claremont and so we had the honor of having our wedding ceremony at Claremont United Methodist Church and then the reception at my parents' backyard. And um, this included lots of food and dancing, and yes, definitely lots of wine. And now a few days before I got married, I was kind of freaking out because there are so many details to take care of. You know, and for those of you who are grandparents, you've seen it with your children. For those of you who've gotten married yourself, you know that there are so many details to take care of. And um, before I got married, when I was in the height of my anxiety, one of my good friends said to me, I know you find all this wedding planning overwhelming, but as much as you can, try to enjoy this one day of your life because it's the only day that people from all parts of your life have gathered just for you. All phase of life have gathered just for you. It'll be this day and your funeral, but you won't be alive to connect with them on your funeral. I mean, in the way that they want, right, in the physical form. And I'm so glad that she gave me this piece of wisdom because she was right. It was people from my elementary school days and my college days and that one semester when I was studying abroad in Korea that people gathered together to celebrate me and my union with my husband. And I was so preoccupied with connecting with all these people that every other logistical detail of that day just escape my attention. But the party kept going on because luckily for me, I had my mom and my mother-in-law who was doing a lot of the behind the scenes planning and fixing. My bridesmaids were putting things that were misplaced in the right spots and not letting me know so that I can just continue having fun. They were telling my family members where to be for certain photos and everything like that. And most importantly, my wedding planner made sure that the meal and the drink table was always stocked for people to return for second and third helpings so that they can enjoy the food way into the night. And because of these key people hustling behind me, I as a bride no longer needed to worry about the little details that make a wedding successful. And instead, I was able to enjoy and connect with these people who have gathered for us because they love us. I love that bringing more wine to a wedding was Jesus' first miracle. 
that it wasn't healing a sick person or delivering a very powerful prayer before the meal or letting prisoners free. And this is all very important work and stuff that he does eventually later with his time with the people. No, he doesn't decide to do that for his first miracle. His first miracle is to bring more wine to a wedding. And it wasn't just wine, it was the best wine, the story reads. And it wasn't just a bottle of wine, it was gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of the best wine. Now what does this say about our God? I know a lot of people who've left the church and who have left Christianity because what they've been taught about our God. That God is so strict with an impossible set of standards that we just can't match up to. That God has so many rules for me to follow and I'm failing in this regard and that regard. And for most of Christian history, there's a belief that God looks down upon humans experiencing too much pleasure or happiness. That God always wants us to be practicing some sort of moderation and self-restraint. And I'm thinking specifically of gluttony as one of the seven deadly sins in Dante's Inferno. And while there is certainly wisdom in making sure that we aren't consuming too much in excess because it doesn't feel good for our bodies or our health, I think that this is a very grave misunderstanding that God never wants us to experience too much pleasure or too much happiness. And that in fact, it's the opposite, that a life full of joy and pleasure and happiness and celebration is the kind of life that God desires for us to live. A life of much celebration, a life of connecting with our loved ones, a life of laughing so hard that our stomachs and our faces hurt, that God longs for us to not only experience it, these pleasures in our lifetimes, but God facilitates it, contributes to it, brings more wine to the party. Do you know that this is the God that we worship? Do you know that God longs for you to be happy? That God longs for you to experience deep pleasure down to your bones and deep joy down to your soul. Tomorrow we remember two momentous occasions. The death of two people who truly changed the face of history. The first is the death of Martin Luther King Jr., who advocated for racial equality and did it in a way that was so generous, so kind, and nonviolent. And then the next person that we celebrate tomorrow, and who died more recently, just three years ago, is the poet Mary Oliver, who also changed the face of history with her imagination and her love for the wild world and her words. Now, what do these two people, having lived decades apart from one another, have to do with one another and have to do with today's Bible reading? Is this. They both gave us a taste of the celebratory nature of God's kingdom through their work on earth. They both gave us a taste of the celebratory nature of God's kingdom through their work on earth. You think God wants us to suffer? No, they shared through their ministries. God wants all of us to thrive. You think God wants us to treat people differently based on their skin color or status? No, it is God's intention that all, no matter their race, sex, amount of money they have, physical abilities they have, that we should all experience the immense joy of living on this earth. So in honor of them, Martin Luther King Jr. and Mary Oliver, and in honor of the very first miracle that Jesus performed, 
I want to end this sermon with one of my favorite passages written by Mary Oliver. And it's called Don't Hesitate. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind, but much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back. That sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Don't hesitate. Give in to it. Don't be afraid of its plenty. Where do you hesitate? Where are you afraid of its plenty? Where in your life are you afraid to have more joy? Now I know that on this day that I ask you these questions, we're living in one of the most frightening times in history. And so this mysterious virus has taken over our globe and we've seen people die at an alarming rate because of it. So it seems almost naive and irresponsible for me to remind us that God longs for us to live with more joy and celebration. But I would respond that because of this pandemic and not in spite of it, it is more imperative that we are perceptive of God bringing more wine to the party. And very importantly, to realize that we are also invited by God to be Jesus for the world. To be the ones ourselves who bring more wine to the party. So the second question that I have for you this morning is, where are there opportunities for you to be Jesus for others and bring more joy? There's just too much sadness in the world. Where can you bring more joy? Where can you be Jesus for the world? Perhaps you have a teenager who's going through a rough patch in their life and their last thing that they need is a pet talk. And what they need more of is for you to watch their favorite movie and for you to cook their favorite meal for them. Or perhaps there's a loved one in your life going through an illness and the last thing that they need is a reminder to take their medication and instead just a walk on the beach to see the sunset. Or maybe they just need a laugh by a good joke that you tell them. We mustn't wait for the right time to celebrate our lives or to experience joy. Because if that's what you're waiting for, if you're waiting for the pandemic to end, if you're waiting for the sickness to be over, if you're waiting for this or that or this or that, that time, I'm sorry to tell you, will never come. Because there will always be something. There will always be a new sickness, a new challenge, a new virus, some awful calamity happening in our globe. And so the invitation by God is to choose joy anyway. The party's about to run out of wine. That's okay, I got it. Here's some more. Thanks be to God. Amen.
beautiful anthem this morning. So as the time comes in this point in worship where we get to celebrate our joys and also pray for each other through our struggles as well. And so um, if there are any joys and concerns of this community, you are invited to share them with us now to pray for you. Yes, Linda. One of our choir members, Dorothy Spann, is in the hospital with a blood infection. Uh, our brother and sister John and Nancy Yu are reporting that their son Benny is having learning disability issues, so mm -hmm. prayers for Benny mm -hmm. and Yu. Would you mind sharing his name? Bob Clifton. Bob. And Terry. And Terry. Uh, continued prayers for Judy. For Judy, yes. Good. I'm um, continuing prayers for my daughter-in-law, Nicole. Okay. And her, and her husband, my son, Kevin. Yes. <clears throat> and also the uh, McCready's have been very grateful to all of you who have brought meals and we've extended the meal train. So if you um, would like, uh, uh, there's a, a link on uh, Carol uh, Martin's message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you all for prayers for my family. So we did all end up getting the virus. Uh, it was given to us by a close family friend that we invited for dinner and he unknowingly had it. He was usually very careful that they just come back, came back from travels. And uh, my family, as you can see, are not here with us today, uh, my husband and two kids, because their symptoms started showing up three days after mine. And so their quarantine is uh, being extended right now. But everyone's doing well and I wanna thank you for your prayers and that we've been able to make this out okay. All right, well let us join together in prayer. Dear God, the one who gives us more joy, who opens our eyes to see that our life is a celebration and not just filled with drudgery after pain, after sorrow. The one who invites us to receive your joy and also to share it with others. We come to this time of worship where we are grateful for this gift of life that you have given to us. And we also ask for your help during times when sometimes it does just get to be too difficult. We lift up those prayers that have been lifted in our community knowing that you hear them all and that you care about them all. These people who are your children who you love more than we can even imagine or fathom. For Dorothy, for Jessica, for Benny and his parents, we pray for Bob and Terry and Judy and Robert, for Nicole and Kevin and Sarah and the rest of her family. For all of these family members who are supporting each of these people who are suffering through their illnesses 
and their struggles. We ask for your wisdom. And we also lift up any personal prayers during this time, the ones that we're afraid to ask you for in our hearts because we don't think they're important enough in the midst of all the suffering going on in the world. We lift them up to you now knowing that no struggle or pain is too big for you and no struggle or pain is too small for you to carry. Dear God, we thank you for the one who never leaves us, who always walks beside us, and all through all the ups and downs of our lives. And together, as a community of God, we pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. So I invite you to stand for our closing hymn. And I did hear this morning that this is not a, a hymn that's familiar to all of you at, at this church. So I'm going to stand here at the mic and help with the lyrics. But I just want you to, I want, I want to warn you because it's very high. And I'm in alto and this is like very high. So I apologize.
everybody. Um, a final word that uh, we are still receiving offerings for the strengthening and the growth of this congregation, especially during this time when we're all still uh, in the rebuilding stages. Um, there is an offering plate as you make your way out the door, and you can also give online or through the mail. And now as we go out into the rest of our everyday lives and everything that it entails, May you open your ears and open your hearts to hear the music that's always playing in the air. Go in peace and love and joy. Amen. Amen.